So welcome to this session of Speak Your Mind by Climobilize. My guest today is Dr. Kumar Aya. Kumar, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. It's great to have you here with me. It's a pleasure, Ian. Uh, being a part of this event is something which is, uh, especially when I'm speaking on something which is close to my heart, really special. So thank you for having me on this program. Thank you. That's great. Um, so today, Kumar is going to be speaking about one of the three questions, which is why has declaring climate emergencies failed to create meaningful change? And Kumar, I'd like to open up by asking you a question or maybe making a request and asking and adding a question to it, which is, can you give us a, a really brief review of what are climate declarations and why have they become necessary? And then in your opinion, have they achieved their declared purpose? Over to you. Uh, thanks, Ian, for that question. We are in the midst of unprecedented climate behavior. So uh, we are seeing episodes of extremely heavy rainfall, followed by uh, periods of severe droughts. Wildfires are raging during unseasonal times at different places around the world. We had over 2 billion uh, speak, uh, 2 billion uh, animals and uh, plants burned down in Australia just a couple of years back. So uh, the, this kind of, and then just uh, this past summer, we had huge areas in Canada which was on fire. And they, they came pretty close to burning down human habitat certain means. So this tells us that something is not going right. And these kinds of extreme climate behavior are what are called as climate emergencies. The only solution that uh, governments have, which are in their power, is to declare an emergency so that they can get sweeping powers and then they can take actions which can at least, what I would say, are corrective actions, not so much preventive actions, but at least corrective actions to make sure that the danger is mitigated. And uh, the thing is that it has become necessary because we are seeing more and more of such incidents happening at, all over the world. It's not that they are localized. It's not like they are a few areas which are being targeted year on year. It's, it's being totally random. And it, these kinds of uh, climate behavior is not sparing whether it's the global north or whether it's the global south. Of course, the global south is being affected more than the global north, but, but that doesn't mean that they, they are being spared either. So these climate emergencies which are being declared are the government's coping mechanism for the unprecedented climate that we are seeing. And they have not achieved their desired goals because the view that various governments have is extremely myopic in nature. They're only looking at the current situation and exploring avenues to get out of this situation. It's like, okay, I am in jail. If I have a get out of jail free card, let me play the card and then I go out of jail. It's not like trying to come up with a situation or a trying to come up with a solution which will ensure that I never go to jail. That is not happening. And that is the reason why we, feel, why we see that these incidents are becoming far more frequent than they were in the past. And I, I, I would like to add something here. Gaia is a very gentle and loving mother. But like our parents at home, when the children step out of line, we usually tend to reprimand them. And Gaia hits back in the only way that she can, which is in the form of these climate emergencies. So the one thing that we all have to realize is that we are behaving like immature, petulant children. And we need to correct our ways. But the actions that the governments take are okay, 
my mother has scolded me for now. Let me make sure that I comfort her and tell her that I will not repeat this. But that doesn't mean that I will not do anything else which comprises bad behavior in the future. So, so the actions that the governments are taking are day-to-day -day mitigating actions, not long-term solutions. So that is the reason why we see these climate uh, extreme climate scenarios playing out in different regions in the world. And unfortunately, the poorest regions in the world are the ones who are worst hit because they don't have the resource to resources to recoup after the incident is. I'd say that also they don't have uh, necessarily the resources to prepare ahead of time for what they know is inevitable. I, I, I love that uh, comparison that you made to the petulant child and the uh, and, and the parent who then needs to come and and respond one way or another. That's very interesting. So if, if we look at if we look at what you said, I'd like to ask you then, um, you're obviously saying that these declarations have failed to achieve their goals. Um, because of the shortened, the short-sighted nature of the way that the political system works, and the fact that the politicians are looking to get out of jail instead of preventing the circumstances that led to getting in jail in the first place, so what, in your opinion, could be a possible way forward to make these kinds of declarations more effective and more purposeful, so that they do have the desired impact? So the what only solution in my mind, is that we stop deluding ourselves. We, f we believe that short-term temporary changes in our lifestyles is going to do away with these kinds of extreme climate situations. Let me give you a few examples. We believe that switching from fossil fuel-based energy sources to renewable energy sources is going to be a solution for climate emergency. What we fail to and and we're all working extremely hard and blaming a fossil blaming the fossil fuel industry. Maybe it's justified to an extent, but they're not the only culprits. Let me put it this way. Any fossil fuel, the only solution is for it to remain in the ground. But the other thing to do, which also concerns fossil fuels, is that once it is drawn out from the ground, it cannot be stored. It has to be used. Which means when someone is mining fossil fuel, there is someone who has a demand for that fossil fuel also. So it's a question of demand and supply. You cannot just stop the supply side of things and not curtail the demand side of things. So we have to realize that transitioning from fossil fuels to renewables is not a solution for climate change. It's a solution for the inner energy industry to stay relevant. Similarly, we talk about EVs as the solution compared to, let's say, your normal IC engines or your diesel engines. That's not a solution for, for climate change. That's a solution for the automobile industry. Having the same number of cars on the road, whether they are IC or whether they are EV, your requirement of resources is going to remain the same. So it's a solution for the automobile industry to ensure their survival. It's not, a, it's not a solution for the climate emergency that we are facing. We have to realize that business as usual is not the solution. Just making sure that you're making minor changes in the way the energy is consumed is not going to solve the problem. The only solution is descaling your energy consumption. Going back from luxuries to necessities is the way we have to, is the only way we can come out of this emergency. Let me give you the example of various forum at which 
you have millions of people coming together. They fly in on their private jets, spend days in air-conditioned rooms, discussing, pro proselytizing, and advising the rest of the world to tighten their belts because we have a climate emergency. We look at the look at the irony of the whole thing. You know, people who are by their behavior exhibiting the highest carbon footprint in the world are advising people who are with minuscule carbon footprints to tighten their belts further. I mean, I am already at nothing. How much lower can I go? So you it's it's the people who are in these positions of power that need to realize that drastic changes are required. We need to make sure that we scale back, curtail our demands, and make sure that we focus all our energies in the right direction to ensure that we mitigate these crises. I mean, we had Apple, which put out a ad some time back about their sustainability report. I'm sure a lot of people have seen it. You know, they had it was a very innovative ad where they had Mother Earth as one of the participants on the table, and Mother Earth was saying, "What about climate change? And what about sustainability?" and and various executives from Apple, Tim Cook included, were talking about how Apple is doing various things to mitigate this climate change which is happening. What I would have liked is for Tim Cook to say, okay, for the next two years, we're not going to introduce any more new models. The reason being, I don't need to extract resources. When I have to when I have to make new phones, I need to extract resources. And with the ever increasing demand for phones, why can't they make the battery life longer? Why can't they say that these phones have to last a minimum of five years? We will not exchange these phones unless they have lasted five years. But we will but we will never see those kinds of statements coming out of any organization. For the simple reason that their first and foremost responsibility is towards the shareholders, and the shareholders will not like it. So as long as organizations are being driven by shareholder values, and as long as governments are being driven by these capitalistic corporations, we're not going to see a single agency step forward and say, okay, I've had enough. I'm going to descale. Till we reach that stage, and till we have enough voices in the world which says that, okay, I've had enough. I'm not going to buy anything for the next year, next two years. We're not going to see any changes in the way these climate emergencies are. Our consumption patterns have to change. Our thought processes have to change. We have to start thinking of the entire globe as one community and realize that, you know, my actions in one corner of the world can have a serious impact on someone else residing in another corner of the world. It's not like just because I'm maybe half a continent away or a you know, I'm not going to be affected by events which are happening in another part of the world. We're all interconnected very deeply. And we all need to start thinking of us as one world, one community. Uh, that's very interesting. I love the way that you reframe the perspective of EVs. They're not a solution for climate change. They're a solution for the car industry, the, the vehicle industry to stay relevant. Renewables are not a solution for climate change, they're a solution for the energy industry. So it really does require a reframing of how we look at uh, of how we look at these different sectors and who are they really serving. 
you know, whether they're serving themselves or whether they're serving that, that, that other goal. Well, wow. so many interesting thoughts in what you've said. Um, I'm aware of uh, I'm aware of our time. Would you like to maybe, you know, leave us with a couple parting thoughts? Um, how do we work our way out of this out of the climate crisis? You know, ideally, we would eliminate the need for even having these declarations. You know, we need we need to get to the stage where we reframe and, and we and we start operating at a different scale. Would would you would you like to you know maybe maybe build on that as the in your parting comments or or the the you know the final thoughts that you'd like our audience to take away with them? Yeah, uh, the thing that we need to realize is that we really have to look at. We, I mean, we have grown enough. We need to now look at development, and with development, we need also need to factor in e growth. Peak growth is 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 a is a idea which is gaining currency globally. I mean, there are a lot of thoughts which are which are floating around saying that that is the only way. I mean, look at it. In 2023, the Earth Overshoot Day was in the last week of July, which means we have consumed the resources that is allocated to us for that year within seven months. And for the remaining five months, which means for almost 75, 70 plus percent of the year, we have been consuming excess of what the earth can absorb in a year. Until we push back the earth overshoot day to 31st December or even beyond, we're not going to get out of this crisis. I mean, we are talking about 1.5 degrees Celsius as the climate warming uh, threshold. Five years down the road, they will push it down. To two, they will push it up to two degrees because we we haven't achieved 1.5. But if what the scientists say, and we've only we've only managed to, or, or we are at 1.2 right now, yet the consequences of 1.2 is that we are declaring climate emergencies all over the world. If 1.2 is so bad. You can imagine what 1.5 will be and what two can possibly pose. So the only way out of this crisis is to go, is to take a pause, say enough, you know, okay. So maybe I don't buy a new TV this year. Maybe I can go instead of eight hours of air conditioning, I can, I can stay with three hours of air conditioning. You know, instead of taking my car to go to the supermarket, I could just walk the distance. You know, some of these lifestyle changes, if each one of us can do it, that is what that is what is going to pull us back from the brink. Not all these government declarations, not the COPs that we have, not the various uh, annual meetings that WEF organizes. They're just blah, blah, blah. There's this nothing, there's no concrete action that's going to come out of them. Concrete action has to come when the citizens rise up. They say enough. I mean, we all can make a difference. I mean, if all of us decide not to buy that extra extra pair of jeans this year, you say, okay, I have three shirts, I can maybe put off buying a shirt till the next year. If all of us can do that, let's say we I'm I'm going to live healthy, I'm going to eat only local produce. Let me not let me not get exotic fruits from all over the world, which is not native to my region. These are the kinds of things that we have to do. Go local, stay, because ultimately, going local is what going to is what's going to make you survive. Not flying in fruits from all over the world, fruits and vegetables from all over the world. Not fly, ferrying uh, food grains halfway across the ocean just to satisfy your needs. Because your your celebration calls for something exotic, that is not the way. That is not the way that we are going to get out of this crisis. So we have to, and and this is what I say: QBL is the way. We have to think from our conscience, put ourselves in the shoes of the other person, and say, if if this happened to me, how would I feel? If if the answer is I'll feel good then go ahead and do it. 
But if the answer is no, I would not like it, then don't do it. We should start listening to our conscience. We should start believing in our principles. That is the only way forward. We have to think of the other person as an equal to ourselves. Interesting. You know, if I were to summarize it into just a few words, it seems to be a combination of changing the scale and scope of how we look at the world around us and our consumption patterns within it, combined with uh, the, the very simple, a, a little bit of empathy or sympathy uh, for others. Very interesting. But Kumar, this has been uh, extremely interesting. Thank you again so much for joining and 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 sharing your thoughts. That's exactly what this um, that this event is all about. It's about hearing about different perspectives. You know, when we talk about climate change, uh, climate emergency declarations, people often say the government must do this, the government must do that. Here, you're bringing a different approach, which is if people change the scale and the scope of their consumption and are a little bit more considerate, then there's also a lot that we can uh, take into our own hands to to have an impact. So I think that's, you know, again, I really appreciate your joining us. And uh, for me, that's the takeaway uh, that I take from from what you what you what you what you've spoken about. So thank you again. Thank you, Ian. Thank you so much for having me on this platform and for giving me the opportunity to spend some time and share my ideas and my thoughts with the various participants in this on this platform. Thank you for this conversation and good luck to you and good luck to the program going forward. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Looking forward to continuing this of course with you in the new year. So, Absolutely. Thanks again. Take care. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye.